Coming off a severe knee injury, the Seahawks have a tough choice to make with Jordan Brooks and his pending fifth-year option. Should they pick it up for the star linebacker, or should they risk letting him go after the end of his rookie contract? Dallas Cooper and I will be breaking it all down in our latest installment of Locked on Seahawks. You are Locked on Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Greetings 12. This is Corbin Smith, host of the Locked On Seahawks podcast. Happy Thursday to all of our listeners. Glad to be joined by my co-host Dallas Cooper and a special thanks to all the 12s out there who make Locked On Seahawks their first listen five days a week. We greatly appreciate it. It's Super Bowl week, which means the NFL Honors Show is coming up on Thursday night. The Seahawks have three players up for major awards. Who's got, a best, who's got the best chance to win tonight in Phoenix? Dallas Cooper and I are going to be breaking it down. Plus, we're going to be taking a look at the tackle group on offense for our end of season report card. And we're going to be discussing a key injury that may impact the decision-making process for the Seahawks with one of their big off-season moves on the agenda in upcoming months. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Host your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. Now for your lead story here on our Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. We're now approaching a month until the start of the new league year. And obviously the Seahawks are going to have a number of decisions they have to make with pending free agents, potential cap casualties, extensions, you name it. John Schneider and the front office are going to be pretty darn busy as they start to build their roster for the 2023 season and draw closer to the draft. But that's not the only things that they have to worry about this offseason. And the timing of an injury to linebacker Jordan Brooks certainly has made this a far more complicated matter. But they've got to decide by May 1st whether they are going to pick up the star linebacker's fifth-year option as a former first-round pick, and we now know the value. It's going to be $12.7 million fully guaranteed in 2024 if they decide to pick up that option. And it's interesting, Dallas. John Schneider has traditionally not used the fifth-year option. In fact, the only time that he has picked up the fifth-year option was last year with Noah Fant, who the team did not draft. He was originally drafted by the Broncos and was included in the Russell Wilson trade. So this has not been something that John Schneider has done typically. He's normally voided that fifth year, and most of those players didn't come back on a second contract. And so this is going to be an interesting dynamic with a player who's been very productive, but also is just in the beginning stages of recovering from reconstruction, reconstructive surgery on his knee after tearing his ACL in December. As you said, the timing of this injury, absolutely unfortunate. Ending off this season with Jordan Brooks getting hurt near the end, it really put a hole into the defense. And this is something that, as all us Seattle fans saw, it's very obvious that there was a missing piece when Jordan Brooks was out. However, I have to say, I think John Schneider is going to continue with his path and not use the fifth-year option on Jordan Brooks. That's too much money guaranteed to a linebacker who's going to be coming back probably mid-season next year, maybe even to the end of next year. Pete Carroll, as you said, is optimistic that hopefully he can come back by week one, but that doesn't seem very likely. And most... I mostly would think Seattle wouldn't want to do that because that's a huge risk for a first round investment of a linebacker. However, Jordan Brooks, as you said, been extremely productive, has gotten a lot of tackles. He's been extremely good as a run defender, but has had struggles in the past defense as well. He's kind of been off and on in the coverage department, been inconsistent. There's flashes of extremely great play with his athleticism. Yet there's also flashes of times where mental mistakes creep in. He happens to be in the wrong zone, picking up the wrong receiver. And there's been instances of that happening. So therefore, I have to feel John Schneider will not be picking up that fifth-year option. I think when you look at his history, that it would point you towards that. 
But this is my counter argument, and this is why I think John Schneider is going to pick up the fifth-year option for the first time on a first-round pick that he and his front office drafted. You mentioned the stats. He is fifth in the NFL since he came into the league in 2020 with 402 tackles, over 400 tackles in three seasons. He's averaged 170 combined tackles in each of the past two seasons. Now, obviously, that's not everything. You can rack especially one of the who was on the field in the league, there were a lot of opportunities for Jordan Brooks. But still, that is an incredible amount of tackles. He's only 25 years old. He just turned 25 a couple months ago, so he's still a very young linebacker that's got a lot of time to develop. And I look at the cost, and I know $12.7 million might seem like a lot, But I think if Jordan Brooks comes back from this injury fully healthy, which most guys now are able to make it back from torn ACLs, they are not the career ender that they used to be. It can be a lengthy process. It can take up to a year to really get back from these injuries. Not everybody's Adrian Peterson where they're rushing for over 2,000 yards after coming back seven months after ACL surgery. Uh, That is not normal. But we could maybe see Jordan Brooks come back fairly early in the 2023 season, especially with him being a linebacker. It's a little different circumstance than Rashad Penny a few years ago, where he only played three games after tearing his ACL the previous December. Running back is a much different position in terms of what you need to be able to do with your knee and that recovery process. So we'll see when he gets back. But this contract, this fifth year would be for 2024. It would not be for next season. So, he would be more than a year removed from the surgery. And I would think with the track record of players coming back from these injuries now, with him not having any other significant damage, it was just an ACL tear. It's not like Brian Monet, who had a bunch of other damage that they're concerned about him coming back from. I think that that helps hasten the process returning and and returning to the player that he was before the injury. And so 12.7 million in the scheme of things for a young linebacker that has put up so many tackles and has shown flashes in coverage. I would think that he's going to be looking to get at least 15 or 16 million per year on a multi-year contract if he gets back healthy and continues to produce the way that he has. So 12.7 million for a year and, and avoiding that big contract one more season down the road from a cap standpoint, I think it makes some sense. And it also gives you a little bit more flexibility with him coming off the injury. Whereas if you don't pick this up, he's a free agent next March. If he comes back and has a big second half of the season, you're going to have a difficult time paying up. So I actually am leaning towards the Seahawks making this move and picking up the 50 year option of a player that I think is very important to the future of their defense. I agree with you that he is important to the future of their defense. Even though I feel that John Schneider is not going to pick up that fifth-year option, I think that they should be looking to negotiate another contract if he proves this following year that he can come back from the injury and be the player he was and hopefully even be better in coverage with his ment- mentality. Hopefully his mental game strengthens while he's on the while sitting on the sidelines, being able to watch film, be able to kind of go into it with his coaches, coaching staff and be able to be the player that Seattle drafted him to be. He's been an excellent run defender, as I said, and he's shown flashes, as you said, but we need the consistency. So hopefully after he gets well with this rehab, that he can be that consistent linebacker and threat that the Seahawks need. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you look at this dynamic, and I can understand the fully guaranteed cost spooking some people at $12.7 million, but that's still a little bit below the market in terms of top 10 linebackers. I think when Jordan Brooks is on his game, that he is a top 10 inside linebacker. I didn't think he was quite as good this year as he was last year, which maybe that's a little bit concerning. There were some steps back, but you also were playing in a new scheme. And I think that that had an impact on players at all three levels of the defense, including the linebackers. And so I think getting that fifth year option it gives you the flexibility where if he does have a big second half next season you know you can negotiate an extension at that point and you can bypass that fifth year option and if he comes back and isn't quite the same player okay it's 12.7 million but now you get another season to evaluate him and and he's a year removed from that injury and hopefully you can get him back playing to the level he was before the injury so I just think it's a win-win situation if we were talking 18 to 20 million then I would be saying, nope, that's a hard pass. But 12.7, I think that is a fair price for a middle linebacker of his talent, his caliber. 
And so for me, it would make sense for John Schneider to pick that up. It's going to be an interesting storyline to watch, though, because they have intel on his recovery that we obviously do not. And the next couple of months, the way that he progresses coming back from this ACL tear, that may very well determine whether or not they pick up that fifth-year option. They may not make that decision right now. They've got time, though, with the deadline being May 1st after the 2023 NFL Draft. Coming up next, we've got NFL Honors in Arizona today, the big award show that happens a few days before the Super Bowl. And unlike some previous seasons, the Seahawks have a number of finalists for prestigious awards. We're going to look at those three candidates and which one has the best chance to win tonight, capture an award in Glendale. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As you get rolling in a new year, you need the right people on your team to help your small business click on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. As a former site manager, I've made plenty of hires over the years, and LinkedIn has always been a go-to for me to find top candidates in sports media. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. They've got simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked in NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked in NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. You're listening to Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is your host, Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined for today's show by my co-host, Dallas Cooper. A special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether you're listening in nearby Everett or you're listening across the country in Boston. We greatly appreciate you making Locked on Seahawks your first listen five days a week. We've got the NFL Honors Show coming up tonight in Glendale, as they've been doing every year for the past couple of seasons. They've turned the award season into a Grammys or Oscars-type award. We've got the red carpet out, bringing all the big NFL stars and coaches for an evening of awards across the board, your MVP, Offensive Rookie of the Year, number of other awards. And Unlike previous seasons, the Seahawks have a number of finalists up for awards after a surprising 9-8 and eight season that culminated in a playoff berth. And Dallas, we're going to be breaking down all three of these awards and lo- looking at the chances for the Seahawks players to win this award tonight. And this is a debate that we've had on and off for the last few weeks, but now that we're actually to the honor show we get our final chance to weigh in on who we think the favorite is to win those awards. So let's start with the Rookie of the Year awards. The Seahawks have a player up for both offensive and defense, starting on the offensive side. Brock Purdy, the quarterback of the 49ers, kind of a surprise that he was added in here because he didn't even play half of the season, but there's no denying the results. Winning all of his regular season games as a starting quarterback for the eventual NFC Championship-bound 49ers. Ken Walker, the third, the Seahawks standout rookie running back, only the second running back in franchise history to have a thousand uh, thousand rushing yards in his rookie season. He is up for the award. And Garrett Wilson, over 1,100 receiving yards for the Jets, despite not having a quarterback to throw the football to him. That's pretty darn impressive. You can make a claim for all three of these players, even Brock Purdy, who played a limited number of games, what he did with that 49ers offense as a seventh round pick and then leading him to the NFC Championship game. I know it's a regular season award, but that's why he is on this list. The impact that he had late in the season as the third string quarterback. And then obviously Walker and Wilson both had big seasons, despite not necessarily having the best circumstances around them. I I think it's a mix between both like how they did and led their teams and how they did in the regular season individually. And that's why my offensive rookie of the year pick has to be Kenneth Walker. Did an absolutely amazing job in his rookie year, stepping up after Rashad Penny being injured, rushing 228 times for 1,050 yards on 4.6 yards per carry with nine touchdowns during the regular season. So absolutely nothing but a playmaker. And let's be let's be honest, the run blocking for the Seahawks at a point in the season 
was a real struggle, especially along the interior of the line. But Kenneth Walker, he made plays no matter what. Did have trouble sometimes trying to bounce runs outside and ended up losing yards. Had kind of the the rookie Saquon Barkley effect where he was trying to bounce runs. But man, when he did get to that outside, he was nothing but a playmaker. And he held on to the ball and was dominant in ball control, not even losing a fumble the entire season. And 69% of his yards were also after contact, forcing 48 missed tackles on the regular season. What an absolutely stellar season by my Offensive Rookie of the Year, Kenneth Walker. Yeah, right now he would be my front runner to win this award for a lot of the reasons you mentioned. The amount of yardage that he created after contact behind an offensive line. And, you know, when we're looking from an honest perspective, there was a four or five game span where you could have put Barry Sanders behind this line. And he probably wasn't going to have much success because they could not run the football to save their lives. And that coincided, not surprisingly, with that slump where they lost five out of six games. For a large chunk of that stretch, they could not run the football. And so Ken Walker III and his backfield mates, they were put in a really tough spot where the offensive line just wasn't creating any push. They weren't making creases to run through. They were allowing defenders into the backfield frequently. And so even considering that, for him to go out and rush for over 1,000 yards and have nine touchdowns, that to me is the big difference maker here. Because what Garrett Wilson did in New York is equally impressive when you're looking from a circumstantial standpoint. This team went through like 15 quarterbacks. We know that Zach Wilson struggled, got benched not once but twice. They gave Joe Flacco some snaps, and he's like 90 years old at this point. Mike White played in a handful of games too. They just couldn't find a quarterback, and that continues to be an issue for the Jets franchise. And yet Garrett Wilson, it didn't matter who was out there playing quarterback. They could have hired the ice cream truck driver that was going by MetLife Stadium a couple times a week, and he probably would have gone for 1,000 yards. He had 1,100 yards, only four touchdowns, though. And I think that is the big difference maker here. And You can look at the quarterback and say four touchdowns with those quarterbacks is equally impressive to what Ken Walker the third did. But I think this is a two-horse race, and this is no offense to Brock Purdy. I think if we were considering the playoff games in there, he'd have a better chance of winning this. But he didn't even start half the season for the 49ers. So I have a hard time putting him in the same category, even though he did impressive things in his limited time as a starter. The other two guys were great all season long. And I just think Ken Walker the third, the touchdowns is a big difference maker here. So I know that Garrett Wilson won this award with other organizations, but I think for the AP award that Ken Walker the third has a very good chance to get this award tonight in Arizona. Now, let's go to the Defensive Rookie of the Year award, and the Seahawks again well represented with Tariq Woolen leading all corners with six interceptions this season. But Sauce Gardner for the Jets, the top five pick, even though he didn't have the interception numbers, had 20 passes defense this year. Quarterbacks limited to a 46% completion percent percentage going against him in coverage this year. Had a couple of interceptions, only allowed one touchdown. Woolen allowed five in comparison. And then maybe the dark horse here, a player that maybe I haven't been taking his candidacy seriously enough. That's Aiden Hutchinson with the Lions. He had three interceptions and nine and a half sacks this year for the upstart Lions as a defensive end. To have that many interceptions, that's really impressive to put those sack numbers up. I right now would have him behind the two corners just because I think what Sauce Gardner and Tariq Woolen did was just even more impressive. Gardner truly was a shutdown corner for the Jets, and Tariq Woolen was a turnover-creating machine. The first rookie since 2000 with six interceptions and three fumble recoveries in the same season. Dallas, who do you think wins this award and why? Although I am a Seattle reporter and podcaster, I have to say, I think Sauce Gardner wins this award. Sauce Gardner not only lived up to the expectations from what he was in college, I think he even exceeded it. I think with the biggest difference, as you said, Woolen, more of a playmaker. Sauce, on the other hand, was a true shutdown corner. People weren't really looking at his side. Just to list off some of the names, and I think the biggest difference comes with the competition played between Woolen and Gardner. Here are some of the receivers that Gardner locked down. 
Amari Cooper, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyreek Hill twice, Jalen Waddle twice, Stephon Diggs twice, and DK Metcalf. Sauce Gardner routinely was going up against elite wide receivers in his rookie year and was nothing short of spectacular. One of the best in terms of catch rate allowed, and he just was purely a shut down corner on that Jets defense. Yeah, and you look at Tariq Woolen and the receivers he went against. Yeah, he had a game against DeAndre Hopkins. There were a lot of receivers he went against. He did not murderers row that Sauce Gardner played against and put up the numbers that he did. That 46% completion rate, only allowing one touchdown in coverage with the names that you just listed off. That is extremely impressive. And so this is one that I've changed on over the past month or so because I thought Tariq Woolen with the impact plays, the interceptions, the fumble recoveries, would win this award. And maybe he still does because this has typically been an award that goes to the guy that makes those impact plays. But Sauce Gardner was so darn good in every other metric the completion rate, the passer rating against pass breakups. He was a better tackler than Tariq Woolen. So I'm like you at this point, I'm leaning at Sauce Gardner winning this award. I think Woolen finishes second. And Hutchinson, while deserving in many regards, I think that he is a distant third in this conversation with the two corners who were both spectacular in their own right this year. Now, the last one, this is the one that has created the most controversy just because there are fans out there and there are media people who believe the comeback player of the year award should only be reserved for people coming back from injuries so Geno Smith being on this list that has drawn some ire from some people who don't think he is really coming back from anything I personally think that he more than deserves to be on this list because he was in the quarterback rubble for seven years as a backup with three different teams that's what he's coming back from. He is coming back from the quarterback abyss. Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley, you can cer certainly make some arguments with the production they had. Barkley, to me, is a distant third here because his ACL injury was a couple years ago, and he played in a lot of games in 2021. Wasn't overly effective, but Christian McCaffrey did miss a lot of games for the Panthers in 2021. Back healthy this year was a Huge addition for the 49ers on the way to the NFC Championship game. So to me, this is a two-horse race between McCaffrey, who's more of that traditional coming back from injury candidate, and Geno Smith, who became just the second quarterback ever, year 10 or later, to make his first Pro Bowl out of nowhere. I'm sorry. It's too good of a feel-good story, and he is coming back from something that a lot of quarterbacks, most quarterbacks in his situation as a backup for seven years, a lot of guys like that don't make it to seven years. They're out of the league. They've washed out. So for him to not only stick with it, but become a starter again and become a top 10, maybe even top five quarterback in some metrics, you have to give him comeback player of the year. And I know there's some people that are going to scoff at that, that think this is just an injury award, but this is a remarkable comeback story of a different variety. As you said, it doesn't get better than a feel-good story like this. Sitting on the bench for seven seasons after everyone not believing you anymore comes out. Pete Carroll says, you're the guy. And he puts up a Pro Bowl season, nearly 70% in completion percentage, over 4,000 yards, 30 touchdowns to only 11 interceptions. This was an amazing scene, season by Gino. What, what do people mean when he's not coming back from something? As you said, He's coming back from being on the bench for seven years. That's a huge comeback. There's not much other quarterbacks in NFL history that would have been able to stick with that. And it's more of the mental strength that that takes. Being on the bench for that long and mentally working yourself to one day prep yourself to become a starter again, that takes tremendous will. And Gino put that all together and had a great season. Yes, McCaffrey's coming back off of injury. But let's be honest, Christian McCaffrey, whether or not he was coming back off, off of injury, we knew Christian McCaffrey is still Christian McCaffrey, an elite running back. Now he's going to the 49ers, and he's going to look a lot better with the Shanahan system. Geno Smith before the season, how much people would have said that Geno Smith would have been a Pro Bowl player? Rarely anybody. Geno Smith has to be the comeback player of the year. I don't Honestly, I don't think it's even close. 
Yeah, I'm kind of with you on this one. And we already saw Geno Smith get several Comeback Player of the Year awards from other outlets. I am very confident that he is going to win this one. And and I'm, you know, maybe a 60-40 on Ken Walker third. I think Tariq Woolen is a long shot because I just think Sauce Gardner at this point, as you and I were both talking about, the numbers don't lie. They might not be the sexy numbers like interceptions and fumble recoveries, but across the board, away from those two stats, he was the better cornerback compared to Tariq Woolen, and I just don't think you could overlook those numbers. So maybe all three of these players end up winning. It could be a very special night for the Seattle Seahawks, but I do think at least two of these players have a legitimate opportunity to win an award tonight, Geno Smith being the one most likely with what he accomplished coming back from seven years of backup. We'll see what happens. NFL honors will be happening tonight in Arizona, so make sure to pay close attention and we'll obviously be talking about that on a later show if the Seahawks do indeed have some award winners tonight leading up to the Super Bowl this weekend. Coming up next, we're going to continue our end-of-season report card going back to the offensive side of the ball in the trenches. The Seahawks started two rookie tackles. How did they fare this season? We're going to look at what went right, what went wrong, and a future prognosis at two key positions along the offensive line. Coming up next here on our Thursday edition of Locked On Seahawks. This episode is brought your way by FanDuel. This year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because FanDuel is the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. We're getting close to the big game, and I'm still leaning towards a big swing of the bat with Travis Kelsey as my MVP pick at plus 1,200. If you're like me and want to make that bet, the FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. And best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. You're listening to the Thursday edition of Locked on Seahawks. This is Corbin Smith. Glad to be joined by my co-host Dallas Cooper for today's show. And a special thanks to all the 12s out there, whether this is your first time listening to Locked on Seahawks or you are a regular diehard listener. We appreciate the support from each and every one of you. Continuing our end of season report card, we are going to the trenches with the offensive line. We've looked at all the skill guys that always draw the big headlines, but when it comes to winning football games, as we're seeing now with the two teams will be playing in the Super Bowl this weekend, offensive and defensive line play is incredibly important. And the Seahawks prioritized their offensive line last draft by picking not just one, but two tackles in the first three rounds. Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas ended up starting 16 regular season games together. They became just the third pair of rookie tackles to start opening week for an NFL team since 1970. So this is a very rare feat. And while there were certainly some lumps, Dallas, I think overall that this season went just as well as Seattle's front office and coaching staff could have hoped for with their two tackles who look like they could be foundational pieces of this offense for years to come. You couldn't have asked for anything better. After the draft, when you draft two tackles in the first three rounds, you're expecting there's going to be some bumps in the road along the rookie season. And you're expecting there is not to be perfect, but you want to see development. Man, did Cross and Lucas not only just develop well throughout the season and game to game, you could even see it play to play, half to half, just the little tiny adjustments they were making. And they seem to get more comfortable with each snap being played. Lucas, for a portion of the season, had a little bit of a health struggle. And I think that's why at the end of the season, he was not as good as he was in the beginning because of the injury. Cross, on the other hand, I feel at the end of the season, got a lot more comfortable. In the beginning, he kind of not struggled, but I would say I think the NFL, he was catching up to the speed of the NFL. And by the end of the season, he looked like he was ready to match it. It's going to be really exciting for the next five years to with this tackle pair. And they're all under contracts. That's the beauty of it. Yeah, you're looking at two players that are just wrapping up the first season under contract. They have at least three years under contract with that rookie deal as affordable tackles. And I look at this group, and I have to give them a solid beat. 
because you even got some good reps from Stone Forsyth in a couple of games filling in for Abraham Lucas. But for these two guys to start almost every single game together and make steady improvements to handle their run blocking duties better than anticipated. I think that's the biggest thing for me because there were certainly some bumps in the road in pass protection. And we expected, I mean, look at the players that they have to go against multiple times a year, the Nick Bosa's of the world, uh, Leonard Floyd with the Rams, the Cardinals have some guys that can do damage off the edge and some of the out of division games that they had to play this year with elite pass rushers. Max Crosby of the Raiders, for example, these two had to deal with elite pass rushers seemingly every week. And so you knew they were going to give up pressures. You knew they were going to give up sacks. There were going to be growing pains. And yet they were able to get over that rookie wall in the second half of the season. When Abraham Lucas came back after sitting out a game, I thought he played outstanding football the last couple of games, only gave up two pressures in that playoff loss to the 49ers. Charles Cross gave up one in that game. And they did a great job neutralizing Nick Bosa, which they didn't do the first two matchups. And so there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic about this group. And as I mentioned, we look at what went right with this group. The first thing that jumps out to me is the run blocking. Now, this might not seem great, but Lucas ranked 26th out of 54 qualified tackles in run blocking, according to Pro Football Focus. Cross ranked 30th out of 54. So Lucas was in the upper half, and Cross almost was. That might not seem like a big deal, Dallas, but these two players were coming from pass-heavy offenses, air raid and run-and-shoot yeah. offenses college level where they hardly were used as run blockers and then they're coming to Seattle where Pete Carroll likes to run the football as much as anybody that is a massive adjustment and for those two to come in particularly in the zone game where their athleticism was able to benefit them getting in proper positions sealing off defenders both of them were in the top 25 in zone blocking grades this year in the run game they've got room to grow in the gap run responsibility but I think that was maybe the biggest plus for this duo this season is that they were better than expected in run blocking. That bodes very well for their future because you know they're only going to get better as they gain experience. Both of them came in with excellent technique. As you said, coming from that air raid system, it's not even just the calls that they're like they're dealing with. They're mostly pass plays in college. Even look at the splits of the linemen. They're more wide. They're, they just play – a whole different kind of game in college and then coming to the league to be able to adjust. And as you said, show the run blocking aspect. There's nothing more you could have asked for if you're a Seattle fan or if you're in the Seattle front office, you wanted these tackles to show improvement. And biggest thing for me, they showed great hand placement on a lot of their blocks, especially cross. He's really skilled at sinking his feet with his punch. I think the both of them, the biggest thing will just be weight room in the NFL. They just need to de develop more core strength and handle more. I see a lot of speed to power moves, especially bull rushers that, that can threaten the edge. Those are the ones that seem to give them trouble. But you add that play strength, and I think you got two really well-groomed tackles to be Seattle's for the next five, potentially even 10 years. Yeah, the strength aspect, especially with Charles Cross, and everybody knew coming in at 315 pounds, he was more of an athlete at left tackle than he was a mauler. And I don't know if he's ever going to be that style player, but you'd like to see him add 5, 10 pounds of muscle to that frame so that he can hold up better at the point of attack and he can set a better anchor in pass pro. Because I agree with you, that's where he seemed to have the most trouble is when opponents were able to turn speed into power. And even Lucas had some issues with that. So I think another offseason for these guys, to really hit the weight room, work on their technique during OTAs and minicamp, that it is going to be immediately seen on the field. These guys are just scratching the surface of their potential, and that's exciting. As far as what went wrong for this group, as I mentioned, the biggest lumps were in pass protection, and you expected it with the murderer's row of pass rushers these guys were going up against. But Cross was third in the NFL in pressures allowed with 48. You know he's going to be looking at that number and wanting to trim that significantly in year two. Lucas allowed nine sacks, tied for the second most in the NFL, even though he was middle of the pack in terms of pressure. So I think there's maybe a little more optimism with Cross in the pass protection department than uh, with Lucas and Cross, I mean. Both finished 39th or worse in pro football focused pass block grades too. So they were not quite as 
well regarded in pass protection, which is kind of interesting when you consider their backgrounds. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that NFL pass rushers, that is a different animal that you are dealing with than the college level, especially the Max Crosby's and the Nick Bosa's of the world. Those guys are not roaming college football fields. They are different beasts. And so you knew there were going to be those roller coaster struggles. But Cross, in three of his last four games, gave up two or fewer pressures. Abraham Lucas, his last two games, gave up two or fewer pressures. And so they got off to really strong uh, finishes. And that bodes well for their future in this regard. There's just a lot to be excited about with this tackle group. I think one thing we're also forgetting, let's look back to the first game of the season, the Broncos game. Their opening night, they're going against Randy Gregory and Bradley Chubb. That is not an easy duel to be going against. And they performed well in that game. So going back just to, from the first game of the season and watching the, the film of that, and then going to the 49er game to end the season, it's night and day between these tackles. They developed so well throughout the season. And you're just looking for them to just, as you said, trim down some of the pressures and sacks allowed. And that, I think, as we talked about, comes a lot with play strength, anchoring versus speed to power. And with the penalties, that's just going to get better because of just the more experience. The more experience you get, less mental mistakes and less penalties you should be having. Yeah, that's the other area where you could certainly see some improvements from these guys. But Damian Lewis, his rookie year, had 13 penalties in the last two years. He has cut those down substantially. So I do think just simply getting experience and playing in a playoff game in a hostile road environment, I think that is going to go a long way towards the development for these guys. It might just seem like it's one game, but that is an experience that is invaluable and you simply cannot replicate for all of Seattle's rookies, but especially for these tackles going up against an elite talent like Nick Bosa and the other good pass rushers that the 49ers have. There's really no limit on the potential of this group. And if you're looking at a position group on Seattle's roster where there should be the most optimism, I think it has to be this tackle group because you've got two starters under contract for at least the next three years. They could be your starters for the next decade, anchors of your offensive line. Stone Forsythe looks like he's going to be a quality swing tackle. And Jake Curhan, even though he sat out a lot of games this year as a healthy scratch, he has starting experience in the NFL as well. And those two guys are going to be under contract for at least – another couple seasons. So they're in really good shape with good young talent that should only get better, especially with the coaching of Andy Dickerson. So there's a lot of reason to be excited about the future for this group. And if you're Geno Smith or whoever is playing quarterback, you got to be excited too that you've got those two pillars on the offensive line that are only going to improve as they continue to gain experience in a pro style offense. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Dallas at Dallas C Cooper. Make sure to check out Locked on Seahawks. We're on all the major podcast platforms, and you can listen to us five days a week on YouTube as well. Coming up on our Friday episode, we're going to be joined by a special guest. One of the key members of the Seahawks backfield will be joining us as he prepares to watch the Super Bowl in Arizona. We'll get some intel on this season for the Seahawks, what the future looks like, and much more. Should be a really fun interview that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Go Hawks.